on. Sounds good. Yeah. Big O's been waiting on us. What's up, Big O? Big o. What's going on, Big O? Hold on, it says. What is wrong with this? I don't know. He broke anyway. Up. So we're on right now, right? Now is not the time. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> of course, I can't do anything technology wise. You, you gotta apologize, guys. Tim, no do computers. He's we lost him for like two seconds, and now he came back. But I'm glad all you guys are here. Snazzy Bigfoot, what's up, man? How you doing? It's not working yet. Okay. Chad said he's here for for another guy. He's not on here, Chad. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Who do you think was going to get? I mean, we got Dinsmore outdoors. I mean, oh, he's on. messing with us. He's messing with us. Well, let's kick this thing off, man. Yeah, yeah. I got uh, yeah. We're starting to get some folks on here. I got like seven folks right now watching. Uh, you know, probably later by the time this actually gets to it, guys. Uh, just to let you know, there is about a twelve to twenty second delay from what we see on Google Hangouts to what you guys see over there on YouTube. But I want to welcome you all to Bait Shop Talk. This is our very first episode, so please bear with us if it doesn't exactly go smoothly. Uh, of course, you got me, Joe, your host with Densmore Outdoors. Uh, we got Bubba, Bubba Outdoors. Bubba, say hi. Okay, Bubba, don't say hi. That's fine. Sit there. <laughs> we, got, we got Tim Kidwell. You guys saw in my last video, uh, Saltwater Kayak Fishing. Tim, what's up? What's going on, guys? Uh, how you enjoying? What'd you do with your weekend? How you doing? Dude, so Tyler and I went fishing yesterday. It was a TKO versus Apex bassing uh, trip, and it just did not go well at all. Uh, he he killed me. I thought you guys were uh, teamed up. <laughs> um, we we okay. So how it works is it was me and him versus each other, and then uh, we were also going against two other people. And so basically, our top two went against their top two, and we beat them by like ten pounds. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, yeah. Bubba, how you doing, man? All right, cold. Yeah, it's uh, it sounds like if he beat him like ten pounds, he beat him by by did a lot better than we did. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, guys. Uh, there's going to be a trip that me and Bubba did that's not really going to make it onto YouTube. Uh, we went out to Kingsley Lake. Uh, we thought we was going to. Brave the conditions. We found some nice marks on the fish finder. And we do Carolina rig, football jig, you know, uh, drop shot, any kind of like thing to tempt it. We tried brush piles, we tried ledges, and just couldn't make it happen. It was hard to stay on stay on offshore. It was like 20 mile an hour winds. We're getting like two to threes out there on the lake. So it was pretty interesting. Uh, the only shelter we could find is when we were fishing docks in that really clear water. And, it just wasn't going on. And uh, a guy that's in the bass club with me, he's been fishing that lake for 30 years. He only got two bass that were like one pound. So we didn't feel too bad. You know, but at least we went out there and we gave it a try. Always learn. Always learn something. Hey, Don't well, go on the days. It's blowing 20 miles an hour, apparently, is the lesson. Both of us saved a day, though. Both of us uh, refused and uh, came home and hit the, the ponds near our house, and, and both of us pulled some bass in. So at least we didn't get skunked. So he, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that makes me feel a little bit better that he, uh, you know, the guy that knows the leg didn't get on nothing. Uh, about the only spot that, that we didn't throw is where he caught him at. He caught him up in grass, and you know, that's about the only spot we didn't try. Who would have thought with fifty mile an hour, yeah, you know, fifty degree water temps and and twenty mile an hour winds that they'd have been in two foot of water? You know, right, oh right. So, uh, Bubba, for the guys, there are the people that are on my channel that haven't seen. Uh, like us fish together. Why don't you talk about your channel and like your expertise? You know, tell them about Toad Foo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so basically, uh, you know, my channel started out uh, videos better than a picture. You know, so I I just started recording stuff and uh, and people liked it, so I started uploading more and more. Uh, a lot of what I do is is like backwater creeks, swamps, uh, saltwater here and there you know, lakes here and there, uh, but the vast majority of it's going to be skinny water. Um, you know, some of it in some places would be called a river in other places, but here is creeks. Uh, I want to get as far up in the woods, as, as far up in the swamp and the junk that I can. And uh, usually it's just me and a kayak, unless I got Joe and going to start adding Tim to it here soon. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a bunch of, bunch of skinny water, toad stuff, fishing vegetation, fishing docks, uh, 
you never know what I'm going to catch. I got one on there catching a big old soft shell like that. Gar, brim, bass, mudfish everywhere. Sometimes we hook a gator, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you fish in Florida and don't hook a gator, that means you're doing something wrong. That's All right. right. If you do it on purpose, does that still count? Uh, <laughs> only if you got a only if you got a ticket or a uh, permit for it. That's right. Only if you got a permit. Why don't you go ahead and tell the folks about you a little bit? About me. Okay. So, um, well, first of all, everybody already knows I don't know how to work a computer. That's obvious. If you try to look at this on my YouTube channel, it's not working because I literally just took it down. So about my fishing side, I'm from Kentucky. I'm a Kentucky boy stationed down here in Jacksonville and uh, just bass fishing ponds and uh, started doing tournaments. And then uh, after that, uh, moved over on this side of town, uh, started doing YouTube a little bit more, uh, met Joe. Uh, we, we actually went fishing, uh, bass fishing, and then uh, did a few more videos, and then he finally got me into saltwater fishing, so, and that's where I'm at right now. Yep, got a whole new world to start on now, a whole new bunch more tackle to buy for all the other new species you're going to encounter. Absolutely. Uh, Big O says, thank you for your service. Oh, thank you, Big O. Uh, I, like I said, I don't have a YouTube up, so whatever happens, guys, you... Uh, you have to tell me I don't have the YouTube thing up. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. We'll, we'll relate to you. Uh, okay. Yeah, guys, Big o, I'm glad to see that you're going to go into freshwater. Uh, there's going to be some more freshwater kayak fishing definitely this year going on on the channel. Uh, us three plan on doing some trips around Florida, South uh, Florida, not really South Florida, but Central Florida and the Panhandle because uh, we're going to be going in fishing the Florida Bass Slam, and they're located like all over the state, but we're going to go into more detail about that later on in the show. Mm-hmm. All right. So I'm actually guys to uh, uh, you know if uh, if you ever if you like any one of the three of us go check out the other guys channels just because it's fun to see it sometimes from a different point of view. Uh, you know, like the couple of times me and Joe have been fishing together, I'll go back and we'll watch each other's videos just to see you can catch the hook set or you know a different angle of the same fish or whatever something you might not have seen on the other video on the other guy's camera. So it's always fun to uh, to see it from a different angle. Uh, yeah, there's some stuff I see on my videos I didn't even know happened in the background, like you uh, back there eating frogs. I didn't even know about that until I watched my own video. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> Bruiser Bates frogs taste pretty good because you had a smile on your face. Hey, it's it's better than the pickle. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, guys, let's uh, – I guess let's move it on here. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we'll head on into the local fishing reports. Uh, I'll go ahead and start it off. Uh, saltwater this time of year up here in North Florida. Well, I should say Northeast Florida. Uh, if you're looking for redfish, uh, they're going to be trying to find warmer water. They're not like trout or drum or sheephead. They really don't like the cooler water. So either they're going to be in like really deep holes uh, or you're going to have to go way back into your back creeks. Because it's shallower back there, the water warms up, and that's where they're hanging out. Also, that's where the bait fish are going to be stored up back there. And also their diet starts moving more towards crustaceans, what I found. Uh, when I catch reds in the wintertime, I always check the contents of their stomach to see what they're eating. That way it gives me an idea of what kind of bait to throw next time. And you can find fiddler crabs, blue crabs. Uh, when I fish the creeks and I catch redfish in creeks, I find eels. That's the reason I uh, bought some of those gulp eels. I still haven't really gone out there to try to catch a redfish on a gulp eel, but I got a feeling they would eat it. Uh, as I was saying, sea trout, sea trout and sheep's head and Stuff like that. They love the cold water. They love this time of year. Uh, me and Timmy got on the sheep's trout. Uh, she, uh, I can't talk. The sea trout out there in Fort George Inlet in the inlets. Uh, they're also in the deep holes. And if the water ain't moving, the bite ain't moving either. Uh, me and Timmy got there right there as the tide was starting to end on the last probably 30 minutes of it. And we were killing sea trout. was catching jacks. And then as soon as the tide stopped, they stopped with it. Yeah, then well, that's, uh, uh, a lot of uh, I mean, man, that's that's a lot of Northeast Florida fishing because we don't have a whole heck of a lot of lakes unless we string off into Central Florida. But that's that's tidal fishing, whether it's saltwater or freshwater. If the tide ain't moving, man, it, <laughs> you better kill some time, eat your lunch, tie on whatever you want to tie on. That's the time to do it because it's a uh, it, it's a different game whenever you're fishing tidal. Um, I have heard the sea trout bite is going off right now with this dip in the uh, in the weather. Uh, Sheep's head should be going to town too. Uh, what uh, what you talk about catching reds? Have you caught any reds recently? Found anything in their stomach? Uh, 
last red I caught, they had he had like a like a degraded mullet. I guess that was like the last end of the mullet run or some leftovers. And then uh, like I think he had like some blue crab remnants. Like you can see like the crushed up shell where he got it with his crushers. Um, Rich just checked in. He says salt run is is was a bust in Lake George, so he's giving his own report. Thanks for that, Rich. Appreciate it. Kingsley was a bust too. Me and Bob can tell you. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. What uh, what's the flounder about, about bite like when it's cold? Uh, December the flounder start heading out. They start heading out offshore. What's up, Melvin Williams. Yeah, they start heading out offshore to spawn. So you're mostly the big doormat flounder are going to be offshore. You can still find some inshore, like more around the inlet or the mouth of the creeks, but they're going to be your normal like 13 inch ones. Uh, the sheep said are out there on the rocks at the jetties. You you kind of need a boat get more towards the mouth, closer to the ocean. Me and Tim fished more inland, uh, Blunt Island area. Couldn't get a bite there, and then I didn't get a bite on a sheep's head until I went to uh, out, fished on the Allen McConaughey Ridge at Fort George Inlet. It was a big sheep's head, though. Uh, I saw him. He's probably a good four pounds, four or five pounds. It would have been a really nice sheep's, and, of course, the hook pulled right out because they got those you know, old people teeth. It's hard to hook them. <laughs> Yeah, you you were you weren't too happy about that, and I was actually scared for you because like I even heard you like set the hook fighting that fish, and it just popped right off. I was like, no, that was, yeah. that, was a, that was fun. Hey Melvin, uh, yeah, I just got done saying Kingsley was a bust. Uh, went to Kingsley. The water temperature is around fifty three degrees. We fished anywhere from fifteen to twenty four feet deep on the ledges. We we're marking fish on the graph, but. Uh, I guess with the front, they just wasn't wanting to commit. We couldn't get a bite. Even tried a drop shot, Carolina rig, nothing. We tried flipping docks, couldn't get anything. Uh, a fellow angler that's in the bass club with me, he's been fishing that lake for years. He only ended up getting two bass around a pound and a jack. And he fished uh, on the south end where the grass is. What little bit of grass is left? There's not much grass left after uh, it's 20 degree weather we've been having. I'm sure the hurricane took effect on it. And uh, the one place me and Bubba didn't go. <laughs> but hey, yep. You you always learn something, man. So that's always that's better than the day at work. That's for sure. Well, hey, hey I tell you what. Thanks for taking me with you, anyway, man. It's uh, I we we you know kind of bailed a little bit early because nothing was going on. So we poked around the base a little bit, got to see all the uh, the gun ranges and stuff like that. And for somebody like me that's not in the service, you know, that was still pretty cool, man. So I appreciate you taking me out there with you. It's uh, it's something I don't get to see very often, you know. Yeah, how'd you like uh, we're out there fishing in the middle of it? Reveille starts going off. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, man, I wish the fish would have woke up to it. I know, All right? right? Uh, <laughs> uh, as far as the lakes go, uh, me and Bob are going to try to get out there on the St. John's. Further down south, fish are starting to get into pre-spawn. I'm hearing reports of uh, buck bass starting to build nests, but the females ain't quite wanting to come up there to commit. It's not just uh, a temperature thing. Bass also know when it's time to spawn by how long the days are. Right now we got these really short days. That's why it may, the water temperature may be right. It may be a full moon. But if the day cycle doesn't sync up, then they're not going to commit to spawning. The bucks don't care. They're just like us. They'll find any kind of excuse they can. <laughs> mm. They're just like regular guys. <laughs> uh, Lake right. George is going to be interesting. I got a tournament coming up there. So I've been doing a lot of report on Lake George. Uh, down south this time of year in Okeechobee, the bass should be spawning down there further south. Uh, Tim has a connection down there with Captain Dave with It's a Guy's Life on YouTube. I don't know when the last time you talked to him was, Tim, but I'm pretty sure he's probably still finding some kind of way to hammer him down there. Actually, I just texted him today, and I meant to actually get back with you about it. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you a message when uh, I'll just forward you his message he sent me. Yeah. Uh, the funny thing was, though, for me and Bubba, as soon as we got home, we both had the same idea. We both put on our rain jackets and we both went to the ponds because we weren't about to go home with a skunk at the end of the day. Uh, I caught bass in my pond for some reason. They were on fire in my pond. They were actually up shallow, hitting everything that I could get near them. And uh, from what Bubba, the pictures that Bubba sent me, he was like, he was doing pretty good, too. 
Yeah, man, I hit him up uh, pretty good. I was started out throwing a swim jig, and I got hit at the edge of Hydrilla a couple times in, in probably three, four foot of water. And as soon as the rain started, I started seeing them bust stuff on the top. So I went back to the truck, pulled out the old trusty toad, and then started tearing them up. They were uh, they were active feeding, you know, moving around pretty aggressive. It was uh, finally the water temp. That was kind of the peak. Now the water temp's going back down now. Uh, but that was kind of the peak of our little week long warming up. Finally got some warm water and uh, right right at the beginning of the, the front pushing in. So that got them turned on there. I don't I guess it was just too crappy a weather out there in uh, <laughs> Kingsley, but they were fired up back home. But uh, I guess talking about hitting ponds, Tim, Tim, tell us what's uh, what's been going on with the ponds lately, man. All right, so yesterday, like, uh, I don't know if I we were live when we said this, but Apex Bassett and I went uh, to a pond down towards St. Augustine, and we were fishing against each other. And uh, so it was like 40 degrees outside. It was bad. It was cloudy. The wind was horrible. The water was moving, though. But uh, the water was a lot warmer than it was outside. So I guess it really just depends on where you're at as far as the water temperature goes and whether or not it's going to match the uh, the actual temperature outside. But luckily for us, the water was a little bit warmer, and all the bass that we were catching were up towards the bank. Um, but I was fishing a worm most of the day. Um, even if it is cold or whatever, just always fish slow, especially around this time of year. Uh, that's my highly recommendation. Um, actually, this right here is, I'm going to give a little sneak peek for the video, but like the biggest fish I caught that day was a three... Three seven, I believe. That's so, pretty good. That's a good fish. Yeah. Yep, so uh, pond fishing is doing pretty well. Like I said, always just fish a little bit slow. Um, but they're they're on the bank right now. Um, but I don't know how deep that pond is. So that's my high relic, uh, recommendation, man. What uh, would you catch them on? So, Joe, you're going to like this. I caught five out of the six fish that I did catch on a U-Vibe speed worm, June bug color. So I say that we're going to be going into that topic here real soon. Uh, yeah. Bubba, did you, when's the last time you've been up in the creeks, uh, like, you know, for the people that don't know what creeks I'm talking about, Thanks, Scotty. Like Goodsby and uh, Jolington and some of your other favorite creeks you like to fish. Yeah, uh, I guess the I went one time after you and I went, uh, Joe and I recently went whenever it was freaking, man, I don't know, what was it? It was 40 degrees, the water temp was low 50s, it was like 50, 52. And I went one time after that, it was also nasty weather. Uh, but it's, it's creeks, as far as creeks go right now, it's a waiting game. Their uh, this weather's been so up and down. You know, typically this time of year they start moving into the, like the staging area at the mouth of creeks right off the main river, and they uh, once once the spawn gets on, it gets packed in there. So it's pretty much a waiting game, waiting on them to spawn. I mean, I'm checking ponds and creeks and everything I can see to look for those bucks on beds because uh, once those bucks get on beds, like right now we're seeing kind of a little errant bed here and there. Uh, sometimes it's got a little little small mail on it. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but whenever it, it fires off and it's go time, man, there's beds everywhere. And if you can find like that, like the males on the beds, the females aren't going to be far off. They're going to be in those little staging areas right near the beds where they can get quick access to it from deep water. And uh, and then as soon as the females are on it, boys, I, I'm, uh, <laughs> hey, I'm ready. I'm ready. So, yeah, as far as creeks go right now, it's a waiting game, uh, waiting on it to – they heat up a little bit too once uh from the spawn all the way till the real heat of summer when the water gets too hot when they move back out is is the best creek fishing out of the year it's uh it falls good springtime for me is whenever i really light them up it's uh that's whenever it's go time you, you i've caught my pb is 8.67 caught it in a creek in february um Caught a six last year in February to Creek, and then another couple of other five plus pounders in February. February was was whenever it really lit off last year. Uh, I'm hoping for the same this year. I was thinking we were going to have it early, but we've had these these couple of nasty nasty bits of weather here, and so up and down. They've just been been waiting to get in the creeks, and I'm waiting to get in there after. Yeah, so like February is the magic month. Hey uh, guys, everyone down there in the chat, go ahead and give us a shout out. Tell us where you're chatting from tonight. And uh, let us know, you know, how fishing is going in your area. What's it like last time you went out? Uh, so, to me, plus, I'm real curious where everybody's, you know, where everybody's from that's watching this. Big O, I know you're down there around, like, Fort Lauderdale, Miami area. I got to get down there to catch a peacock. Tim Stone went down there and called a peacock. So, so he's got me beat. <laughs> my first one. 
Guys, yeah, I do want to go ahead and say it again, just, just so if you guys just now are joining, we are, uh, there is a 20 second delay. So just bear with us when it comes to answering your questions and stuff like that. So there is a 20 second delay. Just, just figure out how to say that again. Well, Big O, I'm sorry. I was way off here near Tampa. <laughs> I thought you were on the side. <laughs> Oh, oh no. okay. He dry, oh, he grew up in Miami. Okay, that's why he knows that place so well and where to go. All right. Okay, so we got to get in contact with him so we can uh, fish with him. Uh, All right. Yeah. So first, oh, let's get into the next topic. Um, yeah. So first time saltwater yakking. Um, sorry, I got people coming in. Um, so my first time kayaking uh, saltwater wise, it was a lot of fun. I'm luckily that Joe was there. If I went by myself, I would not know what to do or what to use. But uh, Joe knew what he was doing. So I was just going off what he said, what he mentioned. Uh, we forgot to bring mono. So I was stuck just using braid, but it worked out well. Um, we caught, I caught two sea trout. My first one was 19 inches. Um, go over to my channel or his channel. If it's on his channel or not, I don't remember, but it's on my channel, Tim Kidwell Outdoors and uh plug so um but yeah uh first time it was definitely an experience i almost fell out of the kayak i don't know if joe knew that or not but i almost fell out it oh, happens I heard <laughs> <laughs> it happens you never know what you're gonna get in the water with out there saltwater kayak in the uh, kayak community we refer to that as turtling turtling <laughs> all right well cheers you to go turtling. under your shell <laughs> Um, but, um, so my first time, like how I felt about it, I, I'm used to fishing, uh, fresh water with it. I, I learned how to stand up and it's a, it's a yellow fin. Uh, it's a 10 footer made by vibe and, uh, it, it's, it's got, it's pretty stable. So I'm, I'm very lucky to actually have that specific kayak and, uh, fishing out of Lake Okeechobee and all that stuff. It's, it's, it can definitely hold its own. So how long is it? It's 10 foot. Yeah. Were you listening? <laughs> okay. Uh, go Jags. So what, go Jags. Go what, Jags. What, if there's ever a mistake that's happening, just go Jags. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what'd what you catch out there? I know I saw the video, but for anybody that didn't, what'd you guys catch? So uh, I caught two sea trout, one 19 inches, and the other one was like 15 and a half or 16 inches. Yeah, that's not bad. It's, uh, it's good eating. Yeah. Actually, oh, speaking of eating it, I, I'm messaging Joe back and forth about this because I've never in my life ever filleted or cooked a fish myself. So I did it for the first time with that, and I'm texting. I'm like, dude, what did you use? What did you use? So I, he told me to go watch his video, and I go and watch his video, and I soak it in orange juice and all that stuff. And it turned out pretty well, but I didn't know like it flaked so easily, so it wasn't a fillet. It was more of mashed potato slash sea trout. Fall apart but, uh, on you. Pretty much, uh, but it tasted pretty good. Um, Hard to mess up uh, sea trout. It's pretty forgiving. They, uh, they're they good about it any way you do it. <laughs> um, All right. Uh, we got a question. Ryan Murdoch is wanting to know where's a good place to go catch crappie from a kayak. Uh, Ryan, like the best small water I, I could find to catch crappie, I don't know how much of a drive it is for you, but Palm Coast, believe it or not. Uh, Palm Coast is just full of canals. There's, there's just canal systems everywhere. And if you were to take uh, like a pearl grub with a chartreuse tail, stick it in your rod holder and just paddle down the canals, you're going to get bit. I've completely filled up a cooler and limited out uh, on crappie in there before doing that. Usually once uh, you troll down, you get bit, stop your kayak, kind of judge how far back you had uh, your grub trolling behind you. And just jig that spot. Just go back and just you can just work them over. Those, those canals are probably only about 80 feet wide. So they really don't have much room to go. And also there's T's and intersections in there. And they're, where they're that's at, there's big holes. And they'll hang out in them holes. And if you go there with a bucket of minnows, then it's just game over. You're going to, you're going to wipe them out. I hope that yeah. answers your question. That's probably the uh, the closest place locally too, isn't it? Uh, granted, crappie is not my expertise, but uh, you know everything else. You got to hit some lakes that are probably farther towards Central Florida, but that's probably the closest local to us in Jacksonville, right? Right, right. Uh, they actually uh, catch them in the St. Marys, but more so when they're spawning because they get up on the lily pad flats. Uh, this time of year, they're going out deep 
and they're they're roaming. That's why in those little canals over there, it's so much easier to get them because they're all focused right there. All right. Well, let's. Uh, I guess let's hit uh, while we're talking about kayak and stuff like that. Let's uh, let's get in the kayak versus boat. Uh, pros and cons. I know. Uh, I know we, we. You know, the Tim's probably a little bit newer to kayak, and then than you and I are. Um, you know, so he's he's going to get to figure all this out for the first time. It's fun. Uh, I probably one of my favorite parts is about kayak fishing over over fishing in a boat is. Uh, you can get into a lot of places that you couldn't get into with a boat. There's a lot of places that I'll get into, especially in these creeks and stuff that probably haven't seen, you know, many people in, in years. Uh, I know a lot of it, the, you know, you'll see the main river change all the time and stuff like that. But a lot of these little creeks and stuff, I'll get way back up in there. Sometimes I'm getting out dragging the kayak to get on the other side of a little, little sandbar or something like that. And none of that's ever changed. And, and, yeah, go Gosh, in twenty years, it's uh, that's that's one that's my biggest, I guess, pro for fishing a kayak is getting getting in the skinny water that you can't get into otherwise. Right, and uh, I I started out fishing a boat. I'm pretty new to kayaking. I think I've only been kayaking for about a year and a half. Uh, me, you guys know, I started out with a little cheapo pescador, and then I upgraded to the vibe, and it was a whole other world. I pretty much had to start all over when I got into a kayak because it's nothing like fishing out of a boat. You're real limited on your gear and how much you can take with you. But the thing that I've learned about kayaking is, is it teaches you to slow down. You cover way more water, not so much in the sense as you're going down the bank fast covering water as in you cover every inch of where you're casting. Yeah. So it forces you to slow down and be more methodical and you're catching more fish than you probably would have if you just had, you know, the touch of a trolling motor at your foot just to go on down. It's a lot more effort to pick up the paddles and move down the bank than it is uh, to hit that trolling motor. And also, uh, I've seen a lot of things in a kayak that I would never see in a boat. Like, I've had wildlife come up. Oh, yeah. I've gotten fish right at the nose of the kayak, hit my lure. And uh, probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen, and I, I, I never even do, knew they did it, I've seen a flounder come out of the water to hit a mullet. Like, he came two feet out of the water attacking a mullet. Mm -hmm. That blew my mind. I, I couldn't believe it. It was, it was a big flounder. It was probably about a three pound flounder. Wow. Uh, I'll tell you, yeah, that's uh, one of the things you, I mean, you touched on, on fishing slow. One of the things I like about fishing slow like that too is you learn a lot about where you're fishing that you wouldn't in a boat. And then when you go back in a boat, you've got all these little spots. Like last time that spot held a fish. Last time it was this piling on that dock that held a fish. Uh, you learn all these little spots and you learn the bottom a lot better and, and stuff that you wouldn't normally be able to get your electronics over because you can get straight over the top of it in the kayak and you'll find because you're fishing so much slower, all these little nooks and crannies that from just at a glance, you wouldn't know, you know, think the, the pitcher lure there or whatever. But once you're fishing it that slow and hitting every single spot, then you can, th then you start to learn a lot more about where you're fishing. So there's times when you do go back to the same spot in the boat, you you make sure to hit those spots. Hey, uh, real quick to uh, John Bustam, thanks for the sub, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, good to have you. Nice. Hey guys, so to, for me to answer, and we got a few other questions I can also answer during this. Um, so Big O, you asked what's typical gear you take in your kayak. Well, it really just depends on what kind of kayak you have and how much gear you can actually fit into it. My specific kayak has four rod holders, um, so I normally don't take four because it gets a and like it becomes a pain having a cast. So um, I normally take two in that. And then I also have an Ingle cooler who I'm pro staff with. Uh, there's four rod holders on that that I'll put in the back. And then, uh, so that's pretty much how I use mine. I keep my plastics inside the little container in front of me. Um, let's see, do you all have stand up kayaks? I do. And I believe Joe does too. John, do you have, is your kayak standable? I am the odd one out here in that I'm the only one out of the three of us that fishes in a sit-in kayak. And I'll tell you why I do that is because I bought mine with in mind of a lot of overnight trips. Um, so a lot of times, you know, if I'm stuffing extra camping gear or something in there, traveling down the river, I've got extra, basically double the storage because I don't have to go, you know, a lot of times if you're stacking it on a sit-on-top kayak, stuff gets sketchy if you get too tall with it. Now I can just kind of jam everything up in the bottom of it. And then I've got storage on the top too. So it's almost doubling the storage of it. 
The mm. downside is that it's not a stand-up kayak, but you know, like I said, I bought it in mind with with a bunch of uh, like overnight stuff, so I've got the extra storage. Um, mine I got was not an angler kayak. It was already they had an angler version of it, um, so it already had you know the pilot holes and everything for rod holders and stuff like that. So I put all that in on myself, uh, and it actually worked out a heck of a lot cheaper. The, the angler version of mine was I wanted to say like a hundred, hundred twenty dollars more. Well, I've got uh, four rod holders on it. I got two Scotties on the front, two flush mounts on the back. Put an anchor trolley, uh, you know, just some cow horns on the front of it, uh, and it, all that stuff that I added to it ended up way less than the hundred and twenty dollars in the anchor version got uh, would have cost. And I got to do it how I wanted. I got to put the rod holders where I wanted, the kind of rod holders that I wanted. So I thought that was pretty cool. It's a it's a good option if you guys are looking into buying a kayak. Is buying one that's not already an angler kayak. If you're a little bit of a handyman. It's pretty easy stuff, and it's pretty forgiving on a kayak, too, because you're not doing a whole lot of construction to it. So you really get the, the way to – you can customize it yourself the way you want to. Uh, so, yeah, it, that's the original thing. I'm the only one with a sit-in kayak, uh, but different purpose for it. Um, you know, and You're know, you also the only one that has cow horns on the front of their kayak, which I'm jealous of, right. by the way. Hey, those make fantastic rod holders when I lay a rod down on the front of it. It just sits right on the front of the horns there. <laughs> Everybody you do a how-to video on how to put cow horns on your kayak, there are going to be so many people out there with them. I'll be one of them. <laughs> uh, well, I think we're getting a little biased on the kayak scene because yeah. the kayak versus boats. Uh, me being a boater, you guys know I got the bass boat and everything. Of course, the two biggest advantages of having a boat is range and storage. It's a lot, I can go a lot farther and make a lot further trips to where I think fish have moved to and I can search areas faster where the, to see where they're at and where they're not at. And of course storage, I got rod lockers, you know, I can store underneath the seat, I got more room for electronics, you know, but then again, on the downside of it is you got maintenance, oil you gotta buy, fuel you gotta buy, which nowadays you have to get the expensive non-ethanol fuel because even with the treatments, I don't I don't trust the treatments. I just rather to go ahead and get the non-ethanol and not have to worry about it. And just the upkeep and towing it, it's a lot easier for me to throw a kayak, which is just plastic in the back of the truck. When I get home, I'll take the front, put it on the stand, take the hose, spray all the salt water off, put it in the garage and let it dry out. Whereas the boat, you got to put, you know, all your protective sprays and stuff on it, vacuum it out, get all the 20 million plastic worms and toads from Bubba out of it. And, you know, this <laughs> yeah, is, it's uh, if if we would have been on Kingsley and kayaks, man, we would have not, you know, not that it paid off, but we would have not been able to cover. We covered the entire lake twice, uh, and we would have not been able to do that in the kayaks, at least not, you know, in time. And another thing with the kayak too is is like we fish tidal stuff a lot. You have to worry about the tide, you know. So a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll paddle out. Let the tide drift me back in, man. I don't have to worry about any of that in a boat. I can just scoot from one spot to the other, you know, a little touch of the foot, and I'm going right against the tide. No big deal. So, yeah, that's definitely a pro of the boat is, is the mobility of it. Storage is huge, too, because like Tim was saying, uh, you know, four rod orders. I got four rod orders. I don't take four either. I take three. You're retying a lot. You can't get anywhere near as much lures. You know, I'm, I've got a backpack on there but on my boat. I've got a tackle box, a backpack, a bunch of loose planos. You know, I got everything that I could ever want on there. You can't do that with a kayak. You got to play a guessing game before you ever leave the house on what you want, what you you know, what you're going to use that day. So yeah, that's definitely a big, big benefit of the boat. John yeah, Bossom, Rob, the the real quick. Sorry to interrupt you guys. John Bossom, thank you for the subscribe. Thank you. Sorry. Hey, everybody's getting uh, new subscriptions, but me. <laughs> You're you welcome, I, fellas. I, I lost oh, one yours. today. I'm not gonna lie. I lost one today. I was at 22, 222, and I lost one, and now I'm at 225 today. So it's it's grown. Well, yeah, I got remember what I told you about. If you lose one guy, that's right, and I I prove that. Yep. Yeah. All, all right. right. Uh, I guess we'll go ahead and move into the next topic, which is uh, tournament bass fishing. Uh, I'm the only one out of the group that really fishes tournaments. Well, Tim Tim was he was a co angler all last year for a tournament. Mm -hmm. um, I've been part of a bass club. This is my one-year anniversary. I currently belong to the St. John's Bass Anglers. They're a club that got founded like way back in the 70s. Uh, like Ray Scott told the, our most senior lifetime member 
that, hey, he wanted a bass club started in Jacksonville. Because back in those days, that's how you became a bass master. You joined your local clubs. They had you to the local club, went to fish against everybody in the state. State went on to fish the regionals. Then you get qualified to fish the classic and so on. You became a professional. Nowadays, you start in high school, college, and then go. But uh, some of us joined the military instead of going to college. Yeah. Oh, poor kids. So, yeah. uh, but guys, uh, if you ever wanted to join a bass club, you don't have to own a bass boat in order if you want to start fishing with a bass club. Tim doesn't own a bass uh, bass boat. He, you know, you can fish as a co angler. It's actually nice for fishing as a co angler because I had to fish my first three or four tournaments as a co angler. It's just part of the bylaws before you become a full fledged member, and uh, you learn so much from other anglers. Like I've watched a lot of those they guys have been me. doing it fishing locally for 20 years and I picked up so many good hints. Big O, you leaving us, man? Yeah. He oh won. man. He with the bed. He's he's hit, he's heading out. All right, Big O man. I hope we catch you on See the next you, one. Thanks for being a great subscriber. We appreciate having you. See you, Big O. But uh like you said, you guys you don't have to have a bass boat. You can still sign up. And it's pretty cool. I've made a lot of new friends. Doing this, I'm talking about some 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 great guys that I met along the way in this bass club. Where, you know, they'll hook you up. Even if you're not fishing a club tournament, there might be a place that they fished that you haven't. And you're going to go fish an open tournament. They'll they'll hook you up with some information and what to do. Uh, my next tournament we got coming up is going to be on the famous Lake George, not George's Lake where I caught the big eight pounder, but the actual Lake George. Uh, we're going to be down in Astor, Florida. It's going to be coming up here next week. So wish me luck on that, guys. Uh, this will be the first tournament of the year. I'm actually fishing for points this year. I'm a full-blown qualified member, so I'm wanting to fish the Classic this year and do that. I got to constantly uh, finish near the top. I got a couple spots of mine. Uh, Salt Run is where a lot of guys want to go because, you know, it's, it's spring-fed. It's constantly 72 degree water, so the bass you know, are more active in there. But from all the things I'm hearing, uh, the hurricane really messed it up. The grass is gone. And it's, it's really muddy in there. So I'm going to try to find some other spots. I'm going to try uh, Rick Clun's legendary spot where he got like a 35-pound bag. You know, maybe uh, some of those fish he put back made their way there. I don't know. Uh, right. So Saturday, pre-fish for me is going to be a lot of run and gun, uh, trying to find stuff. And, of course, I'm going to bring you guys along with me. Even if I uh, get skunked, I'll have a little something so you guys can watch it. Thanks, Melvin. I appreciate it. Tim, uh, you want to talk about your tar uh, tournament experience fishing in the backseat? Yeah, so um, actually, I think that's how you found me was one of my uh, co-angling uh, fishing videos, I think, wasn't it? Lake Samson? Yeah, it was, uh, it was Lake Samson. That's where I found you at. So um, I fished with this group, uh, Jack's Bass Club, for a little while. Uh, I went on deployment, so I wasn't able to fish with them, and then I went back to doing it with Apex Bass. And, and then uh, we started slowing down because the same people that we fish with, I'm not really learning a lot. Um, with them. So it's either a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, you can either get teamed up with a good angler or you can team up with a bad angler, but always learn uh, what not to do with a bad angler and what to do with a good angler. So there's always, you know, the ups and downs with that. Um, but as far as my opinion on it now, um, I, I'm not going to fish another uh, bass tournament here in Jacksonville with them. Um, but I, I think I'm a little bit better off on my own trying to figure this stuff out on my own. But it, it's for good. Not, not to do any recruiting or anything, but you're more than welcome to come join our club. <laughs> you know what? I'm thinking about it, Joe. I'm thinking about it. I, I'm oh. going for you, man. <laughs> being the uh, being the one of the three of us that's not the tournament guy, I tell you what, me and, uh, me and Joe are going to start hitting the working man's tournament this summer whenever that kicks back off. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, uh, I maybe have a little bit of a benefit of fishing the area a little bit, uh, so I might have a few little spots there. Uh, but, but, yeah, looking forward to that. You know, it's – it's decent size for a working man's tournament, you know, because it's been around forever. Uh, pot gets pretty decent. And St. John's River produces some big bass. Uh, hey, real quick, too, our bishop, thanks for the sub, buddy. Uh, but, yeah, looking for – Looking forward to getting into, uh, you know, it's it's small, nothing big, but but just getting out is another reason to get out and fish, I guess. I can tell my wife, hey, I got to go tournament tonight. <laughs> yeah, uh, for the folks that don't know what Bubba's talking about, there's a, a place called on the St. John's by Dr. Sinlet up here in the North St. John's called Whitey's Fish Camp. And starting spring, summertime, they put on what they call the Working Men's Tournament, which is every Thursday afternoon. And I don't know what guy really gets off at uh, 2 o'clock so they can be there at 3, but I'd like to have this job. So uh -huh. we're going to try to, you know, if we have to, take some days off and finally do a little team tournament fishing. 
Because usually when me and him both go out, except for this last time, of course, uh, we, used, we usually do pretty good. Uh, I don't know if you guys watched my last video when we did some fall bass fishing on the St. John's where we both caught four pounders and some uh, two pounders and whatnot. I think if we would have took that bag in, we would have been, we've been up there. So we've been looking pretty good. Yeah, considering those conditions, that was a pretty good day. And yeah, yeah, pretty much that for uh, Kings, we've always done pretty good. And, uh, you know, the St. John's is really the kind of stuff we're good at too. Uh, fishing docks, you know, finding some kind of structure. That's, that's what we're kind of good at. So that, that's probably going to work out for us pretty yeah. well. Uh, it'll be fun either way. Fishing the St. John's river. And that was like my comfort zone. <laughs> so I don't feel the advantage there. Right. Uh, so we're going to be moving on. Uh, question to all the viewers right now. If you leave down in the comments below. How many of you guys have some kind of tackle subscription, like be it a lucky tackle box, mystery tackle box, so on like that. You know, if you could just leave me down in the comments, I'd like to see how many y'all have it too. Um, I know I had Mystery Tackle Box for a little while. We're going into that. Uh, Tim, I think you had what? Lucky Tackle Box? I actually had both. Um, but Lucky Tackle Box, I got in, ta in contact with them. And um, I actually I canceled all of them because even though you are getting different, you know, baits and stuff in each tackle box and you're learning different stuff with different baits you've never heard before, some of them I'm just not, you know, I don't really like them that much. So and I canceled on my subscriptions. All right, how about you? How about you, uh, there, Bubba? Well, I've got a mystery tackle box, and I think I started up mine with mystery tackle box after you canceled yours, Joe. Um, and probably the same as 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 Tim, uh, from the sounds of it, because everything that I've got since I had it, uh, I started up in April last year, has been been pretty usable for me. Um, you know, I know a lot of it. I was worried about am I going to get a lot of stuff that's not you know for around here, somebody in the Midwest or something like that. Um, it's been pretty good for me. I've actually got mine from this month right here uh i can run through it real quick i haven't even actually used anything out of it yet um but it's pretty cool got a uh pretty sweet little jerk bait in there uh it's one of the lucky craft ones it's not bad um got a nice carol whole carolina rig set up you got all the terminal tackle for it in there if you can see it without the the glare some of the uh the Catch Crow, their, you know, their brand. It's um, pull one of these out of here. Little, oh man, that smells funky. Looks a lot like a brush hog with a little bit different shape to it. Does it smell like a pickle? No, this one smells like crawfish. It smells like oh, crawfish. Yeah. We keep making the the pickle reference because I bought a a big old giant worm and a bunch of uh, toads made by gambler uh before we went to kingsley and my truck smelled like pickles and christmas tree because i was dropping a christmas tree off to joe to, <laughs> to dump in his pond mix of smell there <laughs> and um the other thing i got in this month i thought this is really cool that's going to be usable is uh it's an underspin um you know nice little jig head underspin there i like that and it's uh those are always usable so i know that's yeah. supposed to be for fresh water but i got a feeling like sea trout would kill that Oh, I bet they would. I bet they would. And then got some hooks to go with the uh, the Carolina rig set up. But yeah, everything that I've gotten with them um, for the vast majority of it, there's a couple of them that I don't that I wouldn't have used uh, just because it doesn't fit my fishing style, but it's usable around here, like deep divers. I don't really use deep divers too much. Um, but other than that, everything's been pretty usable. Uh, and I don't know if that's just they switched it up recently or you know trying to put better stuff in it but i've had a pretty good experience with them uh mine was 50 50 I, like every time i got a box there'd only be maybe two or three items that were like legit name brand items that everybody's familiar with and then they would fill the rest of the box with either sampler packs with like three soft plastics or their catch co own brand stuff in it or something like that would catch small mouth or you know smaller bass which we don't have here in florida you know i had a perch colored not not a like, like a perch like we got in Florida, not a crappie, like a yellow perch colored deep diver. I'm like, you know, I, was, I, I can't use this. I said, I could save the money and just go out and take that money and go to Walmart or Academy and get more stuff that suits suits my style of fishing better. So that's the reason I just ended up canceling. I even went and tried their inshore saltwater box. And once again, you got like some off-brand wannabe DOA shrimp, you know, or you know, some kind of terminal tackle like uh, like Timmy likes to go and buy that bridge fishing shark stuff. <laughs> so it, works. Sorry. it works, but only when you're fishing off a bridge, not when you're fishing with Joe. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to do a video about that, guys. 
uh, the instead of buying like you know going to Walmart and buying these wire pre-made saltwater rigs with 20 million orange beads on it and cable and all no you don't waste your money on that I'm gonna do a video where I'm gonna do like my top five inshore saltwater rigs and how you can just make it yourself with the line that's on your pole so yeah see yeah. see Martin knows what's up. The inshore box was disappointing. I've never had their inshore box, but I'll tell you what, I completely agree on that part of it, on saltwater especially, what everybody likes to call like a fish finder rig or whatever. Uh, those pre-made ones, it, I've, I've been next to people using those and they wouldn't get bit, and I was. Uh, but I'm going to disagree with you on the other end of it. A lot of the off-brand stuff that I'll get in there, I, it works great for me. Like uh, when we were down the St. John's Palatka, that uh, brush hog I was throwing around, I was telling you every time I throw it, I catch something on. It's uh, I don't even remember the name brand of that, but it's you know, it's just a, a brush hog. Um, I'm telling this, you, when a bass like noses down to look at a lure, he's looking to see what brand it is. That's what he's doing. He says, Does that say Zoom or does that say Catch Code? They're Zoom, brand I'm snobs, eating. they're brand snobs. That's what right. you're telling me. Well, the That's uh, what they're doing. The, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a brand snob. I mean, if it's power bait, I'm definitely gonna use it. It's it's just one of my things, man. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the opposite, Joe. Am I pretty good with a Cinco? <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, he got a bat. He got a what was it? It's like a Pringles can full of them. Yeah, uh, well, that's a, a store man, but yeah, that was a uh, big bites bait 100 pack for 15 bucks, and <laughs> I've I've maybe halfway through it after six months, and it kills them. Yeah, you know, so. it's awesome that you said that because it leads us right into our next topic, which is uh, our confidence base 2017. You know, what base were you most confident in using? You're like, what What was the bait you tied on when you needed a bite? Tim, you better know what my bait is, and Bubba, you better know what my bait of 2017 Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I've already mentioned it before. It's, it's the U-Vibe Speed Worm, and I'll tell you what, you know what, that's actually not my go-to. Uh, that's definitely yours, but I actually have three go-tos that just work perfectly. He's got it with him. I, I'm telling you what, these three baits will work <laughs> perfectly no matter where you're at. First one is Reaction Innovations White Trash. That's probably one of my favorite um, uh, swim style baits. My second one is a spinner bait, and my third one is a seven-inch power bait worm. That, those are my go-tos. There's a couple other ones. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go like, uh, like Tim was saying, uh, like Tim was saying, this was my go-to bait. This, was, to me, was like three baits in one. It got me my limit every day out on the semi. Uh, you can use it like a buzz bait, reeling over the top. You can use it like a, a paddle, t like a swim bait, and just like put an eighth ounce weight on it and just reel it through eel grass or pepper grass or whatever. And of course, obviously, you can flip it and use it like where it's intended for as a worm. Uh, with that vibe tail, it gives off that nice thumping vibration under the water. You know, you think about it, we put all these rattles and everything into lures to attract bass. Well, when was the last time when you were snorkeling underwater and you heard a buzz, uh, bluegill swim by and he was rattling? You know, they, they know, they can feel that vibration. Yeah. Like so that's, that's why this was my go-to lure. It was like three lures in one. And this thing, reeling it through eelgrass, is just devastating. And also, also reeling over the top of the lily pads and then let it drop into the holes of the lily pads. So, guys, uh, I'm I'm not sponsored by bidders by any means of the imagination. Yeah. I pay full price in everything. They don't even know who I am. But uh, if you go to uh, bidders baits, you just Google it. That's where you get these from. And this is the Mega Vibe, the Mega Vibe tail. And I use this on a uh, five alt hook with a one eight uh, bullet weight sinker on there. And of course, I peg it that way. You get your sinker down here, and the worms slowly up here. And this was my go-to lure. Well, mine. Uh, you know, I would almost say it's a cinco. Everybody catches fish on a cinco. We know they work. Uh, stick bait, whatever you want to call it. But it's 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 definitely the toads. Uh, you know, when I say toads, there's there's some companies will mess with you when they call them toads and frogs. So toads to me, the difference and should be with all the companies too. There's between a toad and a frog. Everybody says frog, it's hollow body frog. A toad's going to be the soft plastic that works like a subtle buzz bait. Um, now the reason that I like them is you can do so much with them, kind of like what Joe was talking about there. You kind of have to change which one you're using. Sometimes uh, you get the uh, what's popular one, like the Zoom Horny Toad. 
that kind of the kind of feet on those it's it's a little bit quieter it doesn't plop 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 but they're smaller so you can you can let that fall in holes and it's got a nice little kick and action on the way down with it um something like the uh the strike king ones that have the flat end on it those are gonna plop 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 like a buzz bait uh the reason i like these better than a lot of stuff like a buzz bait or a hollow body just absolutely abuse them. I will sling them under docks, skip them, rip them through the worst stuff, you know, heaviest lily pad fields you can find. And they come through all that kind of stuff better than something like a buzz bait would. Um, different sizes of them, different, different profiles, whatever you're, you're looking for bigger fish, you get something uh, like the bruiser baits, giant ones. I can't wait to tear some more up on those. Um, or you can go down to a smaller size, like the Strike King ones. Uh, but yeah, that's it's that's definitely my my confidence bait, my go-to. And who doesn't like top water, right? Yeah. Well, and you, yeah, oh, yeah. Shoot, Bubba. first time I really started using those toads, I was not too good with the hook sets. So I was getting impatient. Now, like using those five tails, and I'm getting more accustomed to it. And I made myself go out and fish those toads. Now I've gotten a lot better at using them, like having the patience to drop the rod down. Feeling pulling away or seeing the line going off, then set the hook. Not hit set the hook as soon as he busts it, even though I think he has it. Yeah, top water in general is like that because you want you see everything happen. You see the strike as it happens. You see him chasing it. Uh, so everything's happening real time instead of you know if, you, if your bait's underwater, you don't see it as much. So you know it's it's a lot easier to jerk it out of the fish's mouth if it's on top water uh because of that because it's it's you see everything happen in real time so you learn after a while with stuff like hollow bodies and, and toads and stuff like that slow it down when the fish is chasing it let him get it all the way in his mouth turn and run with it before you set the hook stuff like that it's uh it's it's definitely an adjustment if you fish something like that all the time but it does transfer over into other stuff like you know Texas rigging the the worms or pitching a creature bait or something like that. It's uh, it, it's something that teaches you how to fish other baits better. If you fish something like that top water a lot, you end up learning more about how to fish other things. Everybody say hi to Tim. He's giving us a tour of his apartment right now. <laughs> He's moving to where. No, he's no. I'm, yeah, I'm. I've been uh, getting some comments and stuff from my phone saying it's a little too loud. So I'm just trying to make it easier for you guys. Thank yeah, you. Moving to where it's quiet. Oh, no, it's in the bedroom where all the sleeping takes place. <laughs> and some other things. Uh, guys, you uh, if you've been with the show since we started, uh, I touched on it earlier. Uh, I know, oh, he, he's, he's done left this. He said he wanted to see some freshwater kayak fishing. That's exactly what uh, we're going to be doing. Uh, me, Tim, and Bubba are going to be tackling the Florida Bass Slam, which is catching all four species of black bass in uh, Florida within one year's time. Uh, those species are largemouth bass, spotted bass, swanee bass, and shoal bass. I didn't even know Florida had spotty, uh, spotted or shoal bass here uh, until I looked up this challenge. But the way it works is uh, you go out and you catch all four species. You submit them to Florida Big Catch online, which is uh, ran by FWC, and then they verify it. And... Uh, what you do is, is at the end of it, of course, you get awarded and you get a nice plaque. And then, you know, it's, you know, all these guys do these stupid challenges on YouTube, like uh, the $5 Walmart challenge or the Barbie Rod challenge. I'm going to do one that really matters to me. I'm going to go out and do a state challenge. I'm going to uh, try to catch all four species. And plus, it, you know, it'd be a cool bucket list thing to do. Uh, it's not just a matter of catching them, though. There's size and weight limits for each fish in order for them to qu even qualify. Uh, I got the little chart right here. Like I said, there's the four species right there on top. Uh, for largemouth bass, they have to be a minimum of 24 inches long or 8 pounds. I can check that one off the list. I'm going to call it that one. Uh, spotted bass, they have to be either 15 inches or 2 pounds to qualify. Uh, for shoal bass, they either got to be 16 inches and 2 pounds. And for swanee bass, which really don't get that big, they got to be either 14 inches or a pound and a half. And uh, me and Tim and Bubba are going to be doing uh, some camping slash kayaking all over Florida. We're going to be going to some real beautiful rivers. We're going to be going to the Santa Fe. We're going to be going to uh, Lake Seminole. We're going to be going to the Chippewa River, which is out there on the Panhandle. And we're going to be trying to catch all four species this year. 
Uh, that was the main goal while we went out on Kingsley. Uh, I got my eight pounder. We was trying to get out there and get Bubba on his eight pounder to kick this thing off. And Tim, uh, like, what's the biggest one you you've gotten so far of uh, 2018? 2018. I'm gonna have to say, well, 2018 probably the three seven. All right. Well, you got you got to step it up. <laughs> We're going to get you out there on the yeah. Johns. But guys, that uh that that goes over, you know, the chasing the Florida Slam. I'm going to start that series, so I'll be looking for that. Uh, my 8-pounder already qualifies, but we're still going to try to go out. Like I said, I'm going to try to get Bubba on his. And yeah, it's going uh, to be a long-running uh, video series. Uh, it's not going to happen all at once, uh, but it's, it's going to run the whole year until we fill it. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's look for that mixed in with everything else that we do. It's, it's going to be a continuing kind of thing. And, there, and like he said, it's, it's going to be some overnights and camping stuff, so there might be some other shenanigans going on in there. And who knows what we're going to get into whenever we do it. But, yeah, it's uh, – it's going to be pretty hard, honestly. It is. It's going to be difficult. It's a it's a good goal to set and a good good goal to chase. That's that's why we're calling it chasing the slam because it's uh, we're literally ha- going to have to go chase it all over <laughs> the top half of the state. Uh, but it, it's going to be fun. It's uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's I, I can't wait to get going on it. Right, uh, Bubba, you ever fish jigs up here in Florida? Uh yeah. Um, you know, pitching jigs a lot. Uh, the 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 saying is that soft plastic is king in Florida. Um, you know, football jigs, we don't get to drag a lot of just because we don't have the bottom for it. Uh, you know, a lot of it being tidal river is a lot of mud bottom with nothing on it. Um, and it's it's almost so sloppy, muddy up here that, that if you drag something like a football jig, you're almost digging into it so much that the fish can't even see the bait. You know, everybody talks about a little puff that uh, – that's going to get their attention. But, uh, you know, up here, man, it's, 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 it's something digging down into the mud you're not going to find. So yeah, a lot of pitching jigs. Um, you know, I have fished football jigs and stuff whenever I, I come up on rocks or something like that. And, uh, yeah, funny thing about it, you know, it likes football jigs, reds. <laughs> yeah. I fish, uh, I fish a lot of brackish stuff often. And, uh, I've caught a bunch of red, uh, probably more reds on football jigs than I have bass. <laughs> well, when it comes to jigs and stuff, and it actually goes into our next topic for the uh, the rod and reel talk, what kind of uh, rods and stuff will you use uh, based off of like freshwater versus saltwater when it comes to using jigs and stuff? Uh, for me, like when I'm throwing my jigs, I'm using uh, like a seven three is like the minimum. Some people like shorter rod to get them up underneath the docks better, but I like having that lot of uh, backbone to get them out from underneath the docks in a hurry and or cover i really only throw jigs in uh underneath docks or on the edge of thick like uh kissimmee grass which those two like kissimmee grass only grows in hard bottom uh Mm -hmm. versus like lily pads which grow in the mud and muck that bubba was talking about and then you know it hits that sand and they can hear that little bit of sand hopping along so that's the only two places and the best time to throw a jig in florida is uh would be right very early spring through the spring and then early summertime because it it really makes that profile of bluegill better than let's say you know a culprit worm which has a nice skinny profile that jig will bulk up and as you know a bluegill has a tall profile he's not slender like a shiner or a minnow and then and they're, when that time of year they're fending off bluegill from their nests or they're hunting them when the bluegills start to spawn because they know it's an easy meal and they know where bluegill nests are going to be at and they can just run in there and raid the net, eat the bluegills off the nest and then run out. So that's where a jig comes really good for that. Um, when it starts getting summertime, temperatures go up. They start getting a little bit more uh, not so aggressive. They're just like us. You know, they were to be sitting up in the shade in the air conditioner and they'd be out in the yard when it's like 98 degrees. So a smaller, more finesse kind of meal. Just like in the wintertime, they don't want to move. is probably the best way to go. So like Bubba's favorite bait, a Cinco or something small, they can just slurp up in a hurry yeah. versus you know, a jig where they think it's a bluegill and they got you know, to work for it. And they really don't want to eat a whole steak. They just want you know, a cheeseburger. Well, that's a, I mean, that's a good point on uh, just, you know, baits in general, but jigs specifically is, is natural forage, what they're eating on. Um, you know, a lot of times when I'm throwing them fishing in brackish stuff where I've caught reds is probably why I've done it 
is uh, why I've caught reds on it is because a lot of times if I'm putting like a craw trailer on it, it's going to look like a fiddler crab. That's probably why I'm or, or a crab, a blue crab, a small blue crab. So that's probably why I'm catching a bunch of reds on it. But yeah, natural forage, uh, whatever they're eating, you know, match the hatch is what they say. That's always, uh, you know, you always got to do that. So it's, it's probably why I'm catching what I'm catching on jigs where I'm doing it is because of where I'm using it. Right. Uh, winter time, if you're going to throw a jig in the winter, their main thing, their main force they start switching over to is crawfish. Because crawfish are the most active in cold water. At the same time, though, they don't really move that fast unless they're scooting backwards. And bass know that. You know, that when they're just kind of crawling along the bottom, they can just look angled down on them and suck them up. Hence why, why I chose, when I, used, I had my jig video, to throw a crawfish imitating jig with a full-size bruiser baits crawl on the back. And uh, somebody asked me the other day, uh, Bubba, I think it was you, uh, do I use the whole crawfish or do I just use a chunk? I use a, a whole crawfish for two reasons. One, when you push that whole crawfish right up against the skirt, it keeps it fluffed out more and it keeps it more bulky and it gives you more movement versus if there's nothing there and it's real slim, it keeps it bulked out when you push that plastic right up against it. And two, it slows down the fall a little bit because I use a half ounce jig and it makes it look uh, a little bit more natural coming through the water. Um, this is the exact jig I, I caught my eight pounder on. This one's going to be retired because that's my PB bass and this is what I got it on. And this is the trailer that I had on it. So whenever I get the mount of that fish, this is the jig that's going to be in its mouth, the actual jig that I caught them on. Awesome, man. It's awesome. Well, talking about uh, talking about winter and when to use jigs and everything, check this out, guys. This is the water temperature for the last month. Uh, let's see if I can get you to see it. You can see that big spike in high right there is December twenty first. Um, so it's it's gone from December twenty first was like sixty five, sixty eight degrees, and then we dropped down at the beginning of January to about forty five, forty three degrees. And then it jumped back up, and then it's back down again. So, man, it's it's got them all goofy right now. It's it's hard to establish a real pattern. They're not following their typical early first of the year pattern because this weather's been crazy like that. And all that happened now on the tail end of that hurricane. Just as soon as everything started to clean up after the hurricane Irma came through here, that's whenever the the water temps started getting all crazy. Uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I've been struggling finding them in a consistent spot. Like I'll find them and then come back the next week, and they'll be somewhere completely different. Right. The temperature's definitely got them on the move. Uh, guys, we're going to try to keep things here rolling. We know you guys got better things to do. And we're going to try to uh, do this every month right in the middle of the month. So probably like whatever Sunday, like the second Sunday of every month, if we start getting a uh, you know, good response to this. I love all the uh, everything, everybody talking down in the chat. I love it. Uh, so the way we're going to try to end this is, we got 11 people watching it on my end right now. This is all time to ask us questions. If you've got any questions or concerns, go ahead, feel free to leave it down in the chat. I'm looking right now. I see that Melvin's hoping to hit Pope Duval this weekend. I hope you do, Melvin. Uh, probably tie on like a swim bait to be able to reel through that grass. So, guys, go ahead and hit us up with any questions that you got. And while we're waiting for questions to come through, you know, uh, I'll kick it off to Bubba if he's got anything to say. Uh, no, I'm just uh, I'm just looking forward to the spring more than anything. Uh, waiting on on the spawn to hit, and that's really it's going to be the best time for me to catch that eight pounder. And then uh, from there on out, man, this guns are blazing uh, all the way until the water temp gets back up to like ninety, and that's when it cools off again. So I'm I'm ready for uh, ready for the spawn, pre-spawn, post-spawn, and then then summer. <laughs> I'm ready for it. Yeah, uh, we got Robert telling me he's just like hit around Fort Clinch. Uh, I'm definitely I need to come up with a video. I need to go up to Fernandina. There's some good spots up there. I'm looking to fish. Uh, I know they get a lot of drum up that way, and maybe I can find a red or two. Haven't fished around Fernandina, especially not in the kayak. There's a couple good places. Uh, Fort Clinch has a lot of rocks on it, and it's right there at the mouth of the ocean. So maybe on a good day I can go up there and try to drift a shrimp down those rocks, and we'll try that out. Uh, He's got tips on hunting redfish slotting up. When can I catch them? It's been random. Or it's, it's random. Uh, Robert, right now, like uh, earlier in the video, I guess you joined us late, by the way. Thank you for joining us, period. 
uh, right now the water's real cold. Redfish are in the slots, or like around the slot limit, have retreated to the creeks. The real big ones are probably going to be deep uh, at the mouth of the jetties, but like the slot size reds, the ones that everybody's hoping to get to put in their cooler, they're going to be going back into the creeks trying to find warm water. That shallow water gets warmed up. And plus what happens is when the tide goes out, the sun hits those mud banks and it warms up that, gets that mud nice and hot. So when the tide comes back in, it's all real warm. And also that's the bait fish do know the same thing and they're back in there hiding. So the redfish have retreated back into the creeks. Uh, around the inlet, usually as soon as the water temp gets around the 60s, my redfish disappear. I have to go back up in the salt marsh to find them. So yeah, I hope that helps you out, Robert. Look for uh, like creek bends, um, you know, where they've been real hard. That's where the pools are going to be at, other ambush points in it. Um, you know, the creeks a lot of times don't hold the same oyster beds that something like the, uh, the flats will. Uh, so look for those bends and creeks when they're in there. Uh, look for that grass in the salt marsh, anything that's got a little pocket in it. Um, that's that's kind of the, the kind of spots you're looking for when they get back up in those creeks. Um, float something down with the tide with it and and hold on. Right, right. And if uh, if your heart's set on reds, there ain't nothing wrong with a tasty sea trout either. And they're a lot more active this time of year. Uh, my go-to for sea trout would be a gulp swimming mullet, the four-inch swimming mullet, chartreuse. Either chartreuse or pearl. Those both work really good. Uh, when That's things start warming on. back up a little bit, I'll go to a uh, Miralure or Miradine. I'll use those. That they get more like they're kind of like a bass. They get a reaction strike. That dark and round and that flash, they can't resist it. I'm looking forward to late March, early April. I'm gonna be doing a uh, BTB, which is Beyond the Breaker kayak trip. Bob, I don't recommend you do it. <laughs> not, <in laughs> not, not mine. Nope. <laughs> so, and I'm going to go after uh, Spanish mackerel. Spanish mackerel start showing up that time of year. So I'm going to be going up to uh, Nassau Sound and doing a BTB trip, looking for some Spanish mackerel here uh, late March, early April. I'll go out uh, there and troll around you. I'll troll circles around you. How about that? Oh, in the little aluminum boat? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, also, guys, what we've got coming up on my channel, I like to get these guys in on it too. Uh, it's going to be some more shark. There's going to be some shark fishing. So get ready for that. I already got a jack in the freezer. I'm saving for shark bait. Uh, apparently, all my other ones went bad during the hurricane. Uh, thoughts, pros, cons on hauling your kayaks, roof racks, trailers, and pickup beds. All right, so I think all three of us can answer this completely differently. I have a Jeep, so uh, I have J-hooks on top of my roof rack, and that's how I set it up. What about you guys? Uh, I got – mine's 13 feet long. It's definitely more heavy and uh, longer than yours. Uh, Tim's kayak I can pick up with, like, one hand. Cause it weighs like 45 pounds i think mine's closer to like 80 85 and i have this is so long and i got a yeah right jeep no it, it's not jeep wrangler he's got like a cherokee uh i have a full-size pickup i got a toolbox in the back so that shortens it so what i have to do is with a 13 foot kayak is open the tailgate slide it in and i have a bed extender you can find bed extenders online uh, you know anywhere from Eighty dollars and up. Some cheaper if you can find a real good deal. I recommend it. I can probably if you have a twelve foot kayak. When I had the twelve foot, uh, I didn't even use a bed extender and it worked just fine. I just took ratchet straps. There's you always like almost every kayak has carrying handles on the side. Took ratchet straps from the bed, ran it through the side carry handles, ratcheted it down, and that was really all I ever did. I mean, and you take a bungee, you run it through the front just to be safe, and also. Uh, now that I have, I've got the five. I put the ratchet strap through the carrying handles, and I take the bungee cord and bungee cord the back part of it down, just so it's not bouncing up and down on the bed extender. And I like having it in a truck because I got both sides on the kayak in the bed to be able to put my other gear, like my cooler, my rods, uh, my bait buckets, so on like that. And I usually keep uh, my life jacket and my little tackle bag and everything in the back seat of my truck. I uh mine I'm, I do both. It depends on what I'm driving. Um, you know, if it's in a pickup, you know, in the bed. Um, and I've also got an SUV that I'll put it on like a luggage rack on the top. Um, but you know, make it do like Joe was saying, lay it flat in the bed of the pickup. I had a buddy of mine put his over. You know, tailgate was up and it was sitting at like a 45 degree angle over the top of it, and it was a hot summer day, and it actually heated up enough that it warped his kayak a little bit, and it looked like a banana. Um, so lay that sucker flat unless you want to be trying to out there with a heat gun, stretching it back in the uh, <laughs> the original shape. 
and you're never going to get it in the right shape. But yeah, either way, you know, what, whatever gets you to the water, um, just, just try to keep in mind, keeping safe with it, uh, that you're not going to damage your kayak. It's not going to come off and hit somebody's car. Um, but however you can get it there, uh, that's pretty much it. And you just want to make sure you take care of it. Cause that's, uh, you know, that's your way of getting around. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm about to hop off here. Um, that is getting kind of late. I got a, got family night coming up. Yep. And, uh, work comes early uh, for me. I got to be up at five. So guys, I think we're going to cut out here. Uh, I want to thank every single one of y'all that joined us tonight. Like I said, leave a comment down and below when we get off of here, let us know what you thought about this. If you want us to keep doing it, if you liked it also, we're, uh, we're looking for guests to bring on the show. Uh, we're trying to get somebody from different parts of the country or at least different parts of the state. So if you're interested in being a guest on Bait Shop Talk, go ahead, send me a private message, and we'll uh, get it set up, and we'll try to get you on there. So hope we can get some more people on this. I hope this grows. Let some folks know about it, that we're starting this up. And we'll be looking for Bait Shop Talk here uh, next month, especially if it, if it catches on. Then, you know, maybe we'll do it more. Maybe we'll do it like twice a month. But for now, we're giving it a try. We're going to try it next month. All right, guys, we'd like to thank you guys. Appreciate you. Nothing but love for y'all. I hope you go out there and just kill them this month. Take uh, what we said with a grain of salt because who knows? You go, go out there in your kayak, your boat, on the bank, find your own groove, and please share it with us on the next episode. Yeah. All right, guys, so I'm going to do my plug real quick. Tim Kettlewell Outdoors. I'm doing a 250 subscriber giveaway, and uh, I think I'm 25 subscribers away. Um, but other than that, guys, there, there's going to be a lot more fishing with all of us together not just video chatting. So just figure out, throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the subs. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining in with us. Uh, look for it to kick off soon here, as soon as it warms up and there's going to be a lot of content from all of us of a bunch of fish, bunch of big fish and uh, all of us working together. Thanks guys. Right. right. And uh, like I said, I got my thousand subscriber given away, so it's not too late if you're, you know, hurry up and j click that subscribe button so you can get in on that. Maybe you get picked, but all right, guys, remember we do more in Dennis more. This has been Bait Shop Talk. I'm Joe. We'll see you next time. Y'all take care. See ya. Yeah.